From the border to our own backyard, immigration, it is taking center stage for this election. Trump, he's promising mass deportations. Harris says she will sign a bipartisan border security bill. And right here in Chicago, a half billion dollars later. We've been stretched to the limits. Having this concentration so quickly caught us all by surprise. And there is tremendous potential political power. The firepower of the Latino vote, next. Thank you for joining us. This is The Brief, I'm Marianne Ahern. Polls show immigration one of the top issues for the upcoming election, specifically our border with Mexico. How to handle people who cross over that border illegally. But before we get to that, what are the key takeaways from this week? If you're keeping your eye on polls in those all important battlegrounds, they're tight and they keep changing. That's our first takeaway for this week. National polls were off in 2016, showing Hillary Clinton in the lead all the way up until the election. And in 2020, polls overestimated Joe Biden's election margins in swing states. The race appears far tighter this year. Takeaway number two, with just days to go, the personal attacks are uh, ramping up. It really is an honor to have you at Durrell. Here's Donald Trump on Kamala Harris during a roundtable with Latino uh, business leaders great, great at his club place. in South Florida. She's slow, low IQ, something. I don't know what the hell it is, but they lie. I've never, we, we don't need another low IQ person. We had one for four years. We don't need another one. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vice President Kamala Harris. And here's the Vice President during a town hall with CNN's Anderson Cooper. It was originally to be a debate between the two candidates, but Trump turned down the invite. Do you think Donald Trump is a fascist? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I, and I also believe that the people who know him best on this subject should be trusted. She's talking Again, about the former president's there. longest serving chief of staff, John Kelly. This week, Kelly said Trump praised Adolf Hitler while in office and put personal loyalty above the Constitution. Our final takeaway, religion, an issue candidates tend to avoid on the campaign trail. The vice president talked about the call she made to her pastor the day President Biden announced he was stepping aside. There's a part of the scripture that talks about Esther and a time such as this, and, um, and that's what we talked about. And it was very comforting for me. And um, Do you and pray every day? I do pray every day. Meanwhile, Trump appealing to Christian voters during a Believers and Ballots Faith Town Hall in Georgia. I say this, faith, when you have faith, when you believe in God, it's, it's a big advantage over people that don't have that. It's a big advantage. Two and a half billion dollars later, the city of Chicago says it will end its migrant mission at the end of this year. Shelters will close and the migrant families will merge into the city's existing programs that help the homeless. NBC5 investigates it's been looking into and reporting on the city's migrant crisis for more than a year, uncovering a landscape where private companies and also developers, they've raked in millions of dollars, while the migrants, they have faced an uphill battle. Here's investigative reporter Bennett Haverly. The population inside Chicago's migrant shelters has been shrinking for months. At the same time, the city's facing a projected billion dollar budget shortfall. Days out before revealing his spending plan, Mayor Brandon Johnson announced the city's migrant mission will effectively stop at the end of the year. Are we announcing this today because the city is in such a financial hole that in order to go forward and sort of, I guess, lessen that blow, You've got to announce this and hopefully inherit some cost savings. We're announcing it today because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Now we'll get to the financial ramifications to it, but I just want the people of Chicago to know that we stand up for our values. Under the One System initiative announced by Johnson, migrant shelters will close by December 31st. Both migrants and other homeless Chicagoans needing housing will have to compete for bed space. 6,800 beds, far fewer than the 15,000 once available in the migrant mission. The city's landing zone will also close in the coming months. The mayor acknowledging when pressed, 
that money is a factor. But the harsh reality is that we can do what we can afford. We've been stretched to the limits. Just last month, NBC5 Investigates was first to report how Mayor Brandon Johnson signed a $100 million contract extension for favorite health care staffing, the Kansas-based company that staffs most of the city's shelters. How do we do that amid this budget crisis? When, when pressed, Johnson sidestepped her question. So we've saved the taxpayers over $200 million. His staff later issued a statement saying the company is owed back pay, which has received more than $308 million so far. This past winter, the Johnson administration had to address allegations of overcrowding and inadequate medical care after a five-year-old boy staying in a city shelter died from sepsis caused by strep. They're showing up sick. Do you hear me? They're showing up sick. Following that tragedy and our reporting that showed the city was aware that overcrowding posed a health risk to migrants and shelter staff, the city soon instituted a 60-day stay policy a plan meant to incentivize migrants to leave the shelter system and resettle elsewhere. Fast forward to now, 10 months later, and a new plan to shutter the system as we know it. A promise from Texas Governor Greg Abbott to send additional busloads of migrants never materialized. <laughs> but challenges remain here. Hello, friend. I'm from Venezuela. Chocolate. It's not uncommon to see migrants asking for money or selling candy on Chicago street corners. This woman told me, when we arrived here, we thought we'd have a job. It's not easy to find work, and we still do not have a work permit. A similar story from this man, who asked not to have his face shown. He panhandles for money and food for his son and wife. Even though the city is closing shelters, there are still migrants who are making their way back to the landing zone and attempting to re-enter the shelter system. It's a pattern that began this spring when the city started evicting people. Of the more than 2,700 people who left the shelter system earlier this year, more than 2,000 have returned. We met this man at the city's landing zone last week. He could be among the last to be reassigned. He told me it's challenging not having a work permit, and that's why migrants have suffered a bit. He told me sometimes I'm ready to throw in the towel and return to my home country. The Johnson administration had initially forecasted spending another $150 million on the migrant mission next year. But given this transition, Johnson said this week that number will change. For The Brief, Bennett Haverly, NBC5 Investigates. Up next, empowering Latino voters, making sure to get that growing population to the polls. Joining us now, the Deputy Mayor for Immigrant, Migrant, and Refugee Rights. That's a long title, Beatrice <laughs> Ponce de Leon. Thank you so much. We've come a long way from the crisis a year ago, where the city stood. Give us now where we're headed, because there's changes underway. There sure are, and thank you so much for having me today. Appreciate the opportunity to share this journey and where we're going. So if we just think back to a, a year ago today, we were trying to open shelters about one a week. We had almost 3,000 people in our police stations and at the airports. And it was really just because people were coming at such high numbers at the border in, with Texas. Um, the governor of Texas using the moment to, to you know, use these, these folks as a political ploy, put people on buses and sent them to, to sanctuary cities, including Chicago. And so this was something unprecedented. We had never had high, rapid numbers of asylum seekers coming to our city. We've always been a city of immigrants. We've always had immigrants. And you can see that across our city, just the, the different groups that came uh, over time. But having this concentration so quickly caught us all by surprise. And cities, including Chicago and others in the interior, had to respond. So is the crisis over? The crisis is over in one regard that there is no longer this high number of people coming so quickly, so rapidly. But we are facing new patterns of migration around the world. Migration is a global phenomenon. We're not the only country that is seeing it. These new, these new ways of people coming through the southern border, not only from Venezuela and Colombia, which I think people are, are very familiar with, but we have migrants who've come here from Haiti, from Ghana, from Senegal, um, Peru, many, many different countries, just not in the high, quick numbers that we saw before. So what is going to be different in the city's response? 
Well, we have transitioned from what was an emergency crisis response to a longer term um, change in the way that we that we handle this situation. And we knew from the beginning that we would have to do that. We knew that we could not sustain an emergency response. What is different is we are now transitioning to close out the new arrivals mission by the end of December. And then starting our new fiscal year and our new calendar year, we will be transitioning into what we're calling the One System Initiative. That's an initiative that we started working on with the state and community partners to merge the two systems, new arrival shelters with the existing shelter system. It will more than double the number of beds that we have in our traditional shelter system. There were 3,000, now there will be 6,800. There was so much debate in the city council of whether or not the migrants received more attention, more money than the homeless, the unhoused. Mm -hmm. Will that be more uh, equitable? Is that the right word? What, what's going to happen as you look forward? Yes, it is definitely a drive towards a more equitable system that everyone would have access to. We learned a lot in the new arrival shelter system about case management, rapid rehousing, building supports to help people on their way. We want to take some of those learnings into the legacy system that serves a different kind of population, but it's Chicagoans who are facing, uh, you know, being unsheltered or unhoused. So it will be more equitable. People will now all have access to this new system. There will not be the shelter stay limits that we saw with new arrivals because the legacy or the traditional system doesn't have them. And, I, and if I could just one yeah. last one about the budget, because of yes. course people are concerned. Does this uh, change then what has been spent? Because what, nearly a half billion dollars the city has spent. What about next year's budget? Oh, it changes it significantly. I won't give those numbers. The budget address is coming up, but the focus is on our homeless services system, and that will serve anyone in need, whether they got here five days ago or they lived here all their lives. All right, thank you so much for the 411 on all of that. I know we could talk to you much longer. Be it his de Leon. Great to have you here. Thank you. Now let's take a look at the growing force of Latino voters ahead of the election. NBC5's Jen Shans, she spoke to activists as well as experts about how to turn that potential into power at the ballot box. We're young Latino voters. There's a lot of us. We have a voice. And 23-year-old Evelyn Aguayo wants it to be heard on election day. Through Southside nonprofit Increase the Peace, she works to get first-time voters registered in neighborhoods like hers, back of the yards. U.S. Census data shows nearly 75% of eligible Latino voters in Illinois are under 55. And nationally, for the first time, Latinos are projected to account for nearly 15% of all eligible voters. In Illinois, between 2010 and 2022, the number of eligible Latino voters increased by more than 423,000, while the number of eligible white and black voters went down. There is tremendous potential political power that has not yet been fully realized. Says Sylvia Puente with the Chicago-based Latino Policy Forum. Puente says it's those young Latino voters in Illinois and Chicago that have the potential to pack a serious punch come November. How big that punch actually is depends on several factors. First, actual voter turnout, which tends to lag amongst young people and Latinos, she says. Just 21% of registered Latino voters went to the polls during Chicago's mayoral election, compared to 61% of registered white voters. Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, running to keep his seat in Illinois' 4th Congressional District, says empowering Latino voters has been gradual compared to other ethnic or racial groups. We're the new kids on the block in many respects. The only challenge that we have is that we need to accelerate our participation, in particular, uh, the African-American community, which is a lot more conscious and aware about the struggle for the right to vote. An August survey from Latino-owned BSP Research shows the Harris-Walls campaign appears to have a solid leg up against likely Latino voters nationally. But 55% of respondents hadn't heard from either campaign. Here in Illinois, a solidly blue state, Puente isn't surprised. There's less investment by either of the federal campaigns, Harris or Trump, to come and spend a lot of dollars. That same survey finds most Latino voters in all age groups are deeply concerned about inflation, jobs, and housing costs, issues ranking high for all voting blocs. Evelyn will be voting in her second presidential election. That's what I do here. Her team reached more than 1,200 people this summer through events and door knocking. They're gearing up for a busy fall to turn political interest into political action. If you want something to change in your community, in order to do that, you have to vote. 
In back of the yards, Jen Schantz, NBC5 News. A bipartisan border bill or mass deportation? What do the candidates plan to do day one? We'll take a look coming up next. What does former President Trump plan to do on day one? He says he's going to secure the border. The issue does remain one of Kamala Harris's biggest vulnerabilities. She's trying to balance border security with those who say we need to be more welcoming to immigrants. Let's dive in to both of their policies. It's the only battleground state that borders Mexico. So Arizona is where the candidates go to talk immigration. When I win on November 5th, the migrant invasion ends and the restoration of our country begins. I reject the false choice that suggests we must either choose between securing our border or creating a system of immigration that is safe, orderly, and humane. We can and we must do both. Kamala Harris, who was tapped by President Biden to be the point person on the border, toured it in September for the first time in more than three years, calling for more Border Patrol agents and new fentanyl detection machines. Under the Biden-Harris administration, there have been a record 10 million illegal border crossings, though crossings dropped dramatically when Biden put in place tougher rules that Democrats demanded. The point is that we have a broken immigration system that needs to be repaired. An NBC News poll asked voters if there's one issue so important you would vote for or against a candidate solely on that basis. Immigration was second only after abortion. Voters named dealing with the border as Donald Trump's top issue. His comments about immigrants, though, have drawn Mexico criticism since he people. first announced They're he was running in 2015. Best. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Under Trump's presidency, border agents separated immigrant children from their parents as one of several programs to crack down on illegal immigration. If elected, he wants to complete the border wall, hire 10,000 additional border agents, and give them a 10 grand bonus, plus boost morale among current staff. After I win, I will be asking Congress immediately to approve a 10% raise, I haven't had one in a long time, for all agents. Earlier this year, the former president convinced Republicans to kill a bipartisan immigration bill that would have added agents to the border. Harris now vowing, if elected, she'll bring back that bill and sign it into law. She also has slammed former President Trump's mass deportation plans. How's that gonna happen? Massive raids? Massive detention camps? And joining us now, DePaul criminology professor Xavier Perez. Thank you so much for your time. We want to hear your story first. Tell us your background, why criminology, even your own, what I read in your bio, how you sort of leaned into this field, especially. Well, I, I'm a children of immigrant uh, parents. We arrived, uh, my father arrived looking for work and then brought us. And we're sort of like part of the American dream, you know, worked um, and then went to school and now became part of the profession that I'm in, in criminology. I found it to be a, a close connection to not only my immigrant parents' background, but also my uh, personal experiences living in Humble Park and, and ra growing around a community that had- Some instances with juvenile justice yourself? Absolutely, absolutely. So at some point, um, I was involved in the street. You know, as a young child, I was also um, under the custody of the state, so without parents without, uh, you know, sort of guidance and, and feedback in that way, then the street became my role models. And then uh, the natural progression, the rite of passage, if you will, of, of growing up in the streets certainly is getting yourself in trouble. So full circle to now be a professor of criminology that studies the impact of immigration. Those who say that immigrants are the reason for the crime, what, what do you tell them? I would say that's probably one of the biggest myths that you can imagine. And historically, I would say to that, there's always been the sort of villainization of immigrants from the Irish to the Italians, Mexicans in different communities. And what we found historically is that they really have never contributed to any sort of crime. The crime has always been attributed to other environment, environmental factors. I would argue that in many cases, if you want to really strengthen communities, introduce immigrants because immigrants revitalize communities. Immigrants come to the United 
United States to work, and in doing so, strengthen the local economies and indirectly reduce crime. Tell us about the current story of going on, going on right now in Springfield, Ohio, that the untrue Facebook reports that the Haitian immigrants are eating cats. How does that impact the immigrants as well as how does it impact the presidential race? Well, you know, I think in many ways it's sort of you build up these myths about individuals who come to this country that we've seen before. When you think about the association of criminality with immigrants, the Mariel boat lift is another example that comes to mind. Anyone who's familiar with like the Scarface uh, sort of ethos of that time period, just associated criminality with immigrants, or in this case with Springfield, like this sort of barbaric behavior. And it really just fuels the fears the anxieties around immigrants that we have. I, I find it a way to maybe playing the immigrant card, if you will, uh, to really just kind of rebel up votes and anxiety of individuals. Do you agree that if immigration is one of the top three presidential issues that the Trump campaign benefits from it? Absolutely. In many ways, as, as we saw throughout the country, immigration was really, never really an issue in those local jurisdictions. Immigrants were working, contributing members of those communities. It's only when it's reveled up in this way that it fuels the fame of, of, of fear in American society, which obviously benefits. And Trump. so what does the Harris campaign do to counter that? They have to be in many ways proactive and get people to understand the facts, debunk many of these myths, if you will. But I think the broader discussion is addressing a, a broader uh, immigration plan that that addresses the pulls and fact the pulls and, uh, and push factors. Like what factors are pu pushing individuals to leave their countries of origin and what factors are pulling them to the United States. If we don't address those broader global push and pull factors, then the, whatever we do along the side of the border is really just going to be inconsequential if we don't. It's like a band-aid to a much broader issue. Well, we appreciate this discussion. Thank you so much. Xavier Perez, criminology professor at DePaul University. Thank you. Thank you. We're getting a lot closer to Election Day. Here are the three things you need to know for next week. Both presidential candidates will be making their final pitches to voters in the week ahead. <laughs> Donald Trump will participate in the Tucker Carlson live tour in Arizona. Kamala Harris will deliver a closing argument speech outside the White House at the same site where Trump spoke on January 6th. And finally, early voting, already well underway in Illinois and Indiana. It goes through November 4th, Election Day, is on the 5th. That's The Brief. Thank you for checking in.